<laughs> Welcome to Bar Chart's weekly series of webinars designed to help you, the investor and trader, better understand a variety of concepts and trading strategies, as well as the pages and tools Bar Chart provides to help you make a more informed investment decision. Today's subject, short straddles. This short-term income generating option strategy is designed to capture inflated premiums from high time decay and falling implied volatility. Now, although this strategy isn't for the faint of heart, because it presents traders with a myriad of risks, a well-planned, timely executed short straddle will allow a patient and disciplined options trader occasional profit opportunities. Hello, my name is John Rowland, and um, today we are going to look at short straddles. We're going to look at the components of short straddles. We're going to look at um, the different types of risks that you need to be aware of in short straddles. But also, I want to introduce to you some of the uh, filter ideas that we can use to help us narrow down our candidates. As always with me today is my partner and our moderator, Gene Baker. Hello, Gene. Good afternoon, John. How are you? I'm doing just fine. And yourself? I'm doing great here. So did you get to make a snowman a couple uh, days ago? No. Well, we had a little bit of snow in Chicago yesterday, but not that much. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry that you did get snow, but just know that, what, spring's just around the corner, right? Supposedly, right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. So we can we can hope for that. All right, Gene. So let's get started, okay? Okay. All right, cool. All right, just a reminder, just a little business that um, you know, all trading has forms of risk and certainly this option strategy, I would say out of all the ones that we've presented to you so far in our series of webinars, this one has the most risk and it's important for you to understand risk and how you uh, how your financial situation um you suitable for you and this might not be a strategy for you and again we at bar chart would always advise you to uh, seek um, the advice of a qualified financial uh, professional okay all right so uh, let me start by saying that there are multiple ways to employ um, our strategy and that for some more experienced options traders uh, they're going to look for um, opportunities right after, let's say, a binary news event, for instance, an earnings report. And they might trade in options, this straddle strategy, um, whose days to expiration might be just one day. I know, it's amazing that there are guys that make a living doing this, um, and I respect them. Uh, others will wait for opportunities to arise in inflated premiums of stocks that they already own. Um, and look to deploy this, uh, deploy this strategy, very similar to a cover call strategy. And then others uh, who know or understand the price personality of a security, and they see the security, they know the security's price will return to an area of consolidation or a cycle of consolidation after an impulse, right? They're going to look for... Uh, a movement, a creation of volatility, and then a fall of volatility. So all of these um, strategies have two things in common and that they look for higher thetas and falling implied volatilities. So the details of the strategy itself is we're gonna be both short a put and a call of the same strike and expiration. Our Risks are many and unlimited, and our maximum profit is difficult to achieve, but it is limited to the premium collected from the onset of our trade. In theory, as long as our price stays between the upper and lower ranges of our break-even price, this will lead to a higher favorable probability in terms of our strategy, our break-even, 
occurs. It's really a term representing uh, the difference between our strike price and the total credit received. Our maximum gain or profit is only possible if price expires exactly on the strike, all right? And this is an unlikely event. So this is one of the reasons when we go deeper into this strategy why we won't go to expiration, right? Because this is a difficult uh, task to, to try to achieve. Uh, our maximum loss is unlimited but it's unlimited by your own stupidity. And now I know I'm being a little harsh here, but um, I just want to understand that any trades we put on, we always wanna make sure that we have ways to manage our risk. And if you don't manage your risk in this one, you could uh, incur some substantial losses. But if price rises exponentially, like for instance in game stock, then, um, your losses will be substantial. And staying to the downside, you will have substantial losses, but your losses will be limited um, to the stock falling to zero. But let me just add that ask a crude oil futures options trader who thought that zero <laughs> was a limit, and they will tell you that you know about a year ago they had this event, this crazy event in options and futures markets. All right, so the set setup. Now, let me just before I start here, I just know that a lot of you are going to go and say, oh, John's picked Snap. I'm going to go and look in the history of this trade. And this was one of the ones that came up on our screener and earlier in the week when I was setting up my slides. So I picked this one not because of how the trade looks like it's going to play out for, for some of the criteria that I use. And the one that, that is definitely one that we're going to talk about is that Snap's earnings is this week. I believe it's Friday. And I really don't feel comfortable having a short straddle position going into an earnings meeting uh, release. But the reason why I picked this one was because I think ultimately it's what we want to try to strive for when we look for uh, the credit we're going to receive and the width of our break-even spread. So in this case here, we you can see that we took in on a $60 call, we took in $5.85, and on the $60 put, we took in $5.75 for a total credit of $11.60. So what we wanna try to do here is this spread between our upper and lower break-even levels, we wanna try to see if we can get them to fit in um, relatively to where we can see our most recent pivot swing high or pivot swing low. And you can see that in this example, here is our recent swing high and here's our recent swing low and that our break evens are right on it. That's why I chose this example. The other thing we kind of want to look for as we look for chart activity is we want to find a strike that is kind of that, that mean or that mean reversion, right? Notice how that the $60 price price is kind of, you know, it, it falls below and then it comes back above and then it falls below and it comes back below. It's kind of gravitating towards that price. Now, you know, we could make some adjustments here and say this, you know, maybe we do a 58 or a 59 strike, but that's the point I'm trying to make here in this setup is we want to make sure that when we set this trade up, we want to try to get that break even spread that's right around the, the distance or the width of our most recent swing highs and swing lows, okay? All right, well, risks, we have a lot of risks that we need to be aware of. And the first one is our assignment risk. And it can happen at any time, and it's more likely to happen uh, if you have some types of price movements, right? So for a call, usually just before the stock goes ex dividend, somebody might exercise you because they wanna own the stock uh, to collect that dividend, right? Um, and um, for puts, if the put becomes in the money. Now, when we talk about in the money, um, we could talk about the difference between the strike price and where current price is. But uh, I want you to be aware of that if I'm selling the put, and for instance, let's say I take in a $5 credit and I'm looking at, let's say, a $100 stock, and price falls below my strike price, let's say $100, and I go below uh, that 95 or that $5 credit, 
that would be in the money because of what the credit I took in on just the put side. So that's where you might start seeing some assignment risk, right? But certainly if you go deep in the money, if you get outside to the outer limits of your break even, uh, you will definitely increase that probability of assignment risk, all right? So if I'm called, right, if I get a call ass uh, assignment, I'm gonna have to purchase the stock to cover the new short position, and most likely this is gonna be at a loss. If I get put assigned, or put it, I call it, um, then I'm obligated to purchase a stock, and most certainly that will be at that higher strike price. But there's another risk in here, right? Just similar to a naked put, is that risk of ownership of that stock, okay? All right, um, expiration risk, right? So let me make this simple for you guys. You can't plan on where the stock is going to settle, right? There's no way, There's just, you just can't do it. You can try to guess, right? But you can't plan on it. So, but I will assure you that, you know, it most likely won't settle correctly right on that strike, right? So there's a lot of scenarios that can happen at expiration, right? Um, you could get a sign on one, especially if price is bouncing around your strike price. You could get a sign on both, or you might not get a sign on neither. And so there's really no way we can plan for all of these, right? So like they say on uh, Shark Tank, <laughs> is for those reasons, I'm out. In other words, seriously, uh, we're not going to go to expiration because it's just too, too difficult for us to uh, plan for that those events, right? And unless I'm a well-capitalized or ex very experienced options trader and because our plan and the nature of this particular strategy, this trade, it's going to be very short-term in duration, right? Right or wrong. I'm only going to probably hold this trade for a short period of time, and I'm going to avoid expiration, right? So our best practice is to close both legs before expiration. Now, don't do this, all right? And this really is about assignment risk as well. And I've seen traders do this. Let's say you're going towards expiration and now the market has moved, let's say, let's say to the upside and you're getting, you know, into the middle of the range between your strike and your upper end of your break even, but you're still making money. And you say, okay, well, you know what? I'm going to take off that bad leg. In other words, I'm going to get out of that call that I shorted and I'm going to hold on to that put that is now getting very close to being worthless, right? Because I'm getting closer to expiration. And sure enough, the day you take off that put and you leave that naked short on, excuse me, that call, and you leave that naked put left on, the market turns around right on a dime and runs back the other way. So it's really important for you is when you make that decision to exit the trade that you exit both trades. And we do want to advocate in this scenario is we're probably going to execute exit this trade uh, before expiration. But there are experienced traders will take this right up uh, to the last minute on expiration day, all right? A volatility is both a friend and foe, all right? And so our risk profile or how we set this strategy makes us embrace implied volatility. So our job really is to stack enhancers uh, in our favor, right? And to point to a falling volatility and not rising implied volatility, all right? So that's kind of what we're gonna be striving for this uh, in this session, all right? Um, in the past, we've talked about um, the Greeks and past option strategies, uh, webinars that we've done and um, their impact on our strategies. So, but I think this is the first time we've actually looked at all four of the Greeks at one time, but, as before, we only have a limited amount of time to discuss or explore uh, the effects of our Greeks on our trade. So if you need greater clarification, please, by all means, I want you to direct your questions, those specific questions to our support team. We have some awesome options traders in on, on our support team. So uh, just keep that in mind as we go through today's session. All right, Delta. Um, and we'll talk about what delta neutral means, but delta, right, is, you know, uh, the chain, uh, 
what we're going to try to do here is we're going to try to strive for a very small net delta, right? The smaller the net delta that we can strive for on this strategy, the less impact it's going to have on small price movements. Uh, theta is a good thing for us, right? I want you to understand that theta is about time decay and the rate of decay will help us choose the right dated option. Uh, vega is related to our implied volatility and it can be both, we just saw both good and bad in its impact. So um, again, we probably want to look for uh, maybe lower vegas, but we would definitely like to find falling implied volatilities. Now, one rule that we can do, which is kind of a hack here, is when I look at theta and vega, is I want to make sure that my theta decay is a lot greater than the impact of price movement on my vega. So one of the rules that a, that a lot of more experienced traders will tell you is they'll use a two or two and a half times theta rule. They want to see their theta be two to two and a half times greater than their vega. So that's an easy rule to remember. All right. And then gamma. We've never really talked about gamma before, but I want you to understand that gamma is, it increases our exposure to price movement. Right. This is um, how much our delta changes with every dollar change. And what can happen with our gamma is it can dramatically alter the bias of our trade, right? We're going in with the assumption that we don't, we just want price to st stay kind of in the same range. But if price starts to move up or down, it will have an inverse effect on our bias. In other words, if price goes up, I'm now going to have a negative, a short bias. Or if price falls, I'm going to have a positive, uh, by a positive bias to this trade. So that can have an effect on our trade when we, if we had the opportunity to go a little bit deeper into gamma. So that's something that you will need to be aware of. Something called gamma positioning. And I don't know if I'm going to get enough time today to go into that. All right. All right. So, so what are some of our keys to success? And I want you to keep in mind these keys as we uh, look for logical filters in our candidate search. All right. So again, time decay, uh, the closer we get to expiration or the passage of time um, improves our results. Falling implied volatility gets us closer to our profit target. Uh, we want to find range bound markets, right? Beginning of sideways trends or that correction consolidation cycle after an impulse, right? Uh, last week we did uh, chart patterns. We talked about flags and triangles and wedges, and all those uh, crazy things. And this strategy would be employed inside of one of those uh, chart formations where we're creating a flag, where we're creating a triangle, or where price is starting to consolidate. So this is where we would employ that one, and not when price is uh, ready to break out. Um, the other one that I want you guys to can think of, and this is not necessarily helping us find candidates, but the reality of this trade is that we're going to look for smaller and more realistic profit targets, right? Because we're not going to go all the way. We're not going to go to expirations. We're not going to get our max profit. So the rule of thumb many experienced traders tell me is they'll use the 25% credit rule. In other words, if I take in $10 of total credit, then if I can get $2.50 out of this trade, 25%, then I'm going to take this trade off, right? I'm going to call, we're going to call this the Steve Miller trades, right? Steve Miller band, right? We're going to take the money and run, right? We're just going to get a small piece of the pie um, and then we're going to thank our lucky stars and run away, right? Um, holding our positions for shorter periods of time, again, shorter durations, you know, um, Again, uh, you know, I might put one of these trades on the beginning of the week and have, take it off by the end of the week, right? And then finally, um, this is really for my retail investors in, in our room today, right? Um, we might use the buildup of implied volati volatility prior to an earnings release. And that's what a lot of traders will do in this scenario. 
to plan a trade, right? So build up of implied volatility to plan a trade, but we don't want to set our trade just prior to earnings, right? Because earnings we know are going to have an effect on our stock price, right? Certainly not going to stay right where we want it to. So who's heard the adage, uh, buy the rumor, sell the news, right? I'm sure all of you have. So buy the rumor, the rise of implied volatility going into earnings. That's our plan. We're going to look for that. Then our execution, right? We're going to sell after the release of earnings. Sell the news, the fall of uh, implied volatility. That's normally what we'll see in the cycle of implied volatility as it relates to um, uh, earnings release. Okay, so that's kind of our game plan. That's the kind of things that we need to be aware of and kind of things that we want to think about as we go into our uh, screen. All right, so let me go to bar chart. Whoops. My apologies. There we go, bar chart. And so here we are in bar chart under the options and short straddles right there. And here's our screener. Okay. So like all of our options strategy pages, um, we have a definition, right? And we have a help page that will walk you through. Um, how the page is laid out. And I want you to notice that our short straddle page is sorted by the break even probability. And the break even probability formula is based on the underlying price, break even, and the 52 week historical. Now, for us, you know, the need to know on this is that the higher the probability, the higher the implied volatility. The higher the implied volatility, the higher the premiums that we're going to find, all right? So this becomes a trade-off for us, right? How close do I wanna hold my hand to the fire? In other words, fire being volatility. And there's this risk-reward ratio, right? This seesaw, if I have a high probability of breaking even, there's going to be greater premiums, right? A lot more reward for me, but also more risk. If I'm looking at lower probabilities, yeah, there's going to be less reward on less risk. So again, it's kind of a seesaw, how much we want to take on versus the reward that we want to achieve. All right. So let me just walk through some of these inputs. So first of all, we have our symbol. And I just want to remind you guys that you can click on the plus sign here and it'll drop down and give you, you know, a lot of quick stats, data, uh, technical, financial, um, uh, fundamental stuff. Our price, our current price, our expiration date, this would be the expiration date of our options, our strike price. Now, notice our strike price is the same. Right, that's because this is what a straddle is. And then um, then the deltas of our two legs are uh, call and put. So here, this is where we're gonna start doing our due diligence. We're gonna eyeball um, this differential between our delta leg one and delta leg two. And what we wanna try to do is, we wanna try to get this as close as possible to 50-50. Now that's a difficult task to do unless, Current price is right on the strike, and uh, there's no skew between our puts and our calls. So this is that delta neutral concept that we kind of hint upon in the beginning. The smaller the net delta, the less impact of small price movements. The wider the net delta, then our position can fall out of balance, right? In other words, the greater exposure to price movement. So we're gonna make some adjustments to our filters in a little bit here. But I think as a general rule, you know, 3% differential is probably something you wanna to try to strive for, right? Obviously, if I can get under 1%, that'd be a really good thing. Um, 
But, you know, outside of 5%, you know, you can start getting what we call a delta exposure and that, you know, you might be uh, at more risk to a price movement, all right? In other words, a greater price movement, all right? Uh, net credit, how much we're going to take in, all right? And this is the total amount that we receive from selling both our options, right? Our put and our call. Now, it should be obvious that the greater the credit, if we're going to go for that 25%, you know, the larger the pie. But this is not always bigger is better, okay? And when we look at the next inputs, we can use some comparatives to help us put this in a better perspective, okay? All right. Um, Percentage of stock, and this is how much credit we received as it relates to the price of the stock. Again, what I'm going to do on this one is I want to make sure that I get enough um, uh, credit and a greater percentage. The larger the percentage of stock, the wider that break-even spread that I showed you in the setup, right? So, for instance, I might find a stock, well, let's look at here. I mean, I see, do see Tesla right here in the front here, but um, let's see what we can do here. For instance, here you see Netflix, you know, our net credit is $33. That's a huge spread, right? Um, but it only represents 6% of the value of the stock. Now, let's see if I can go down a little bit lower. Let's see what we got here. I want to see if I can show you the real extreme on this one um somebody who has a small credit let's see all right so for instance you know here is um i don't know what dmyd is but you know their net this net credit is just under four dollar excuse me uh yeah four dollars but it represents 24% of that price of that stock, right? So there's a probably a higher probability that we would not get stopped out or we would reach that break even because you know this stock would have to move 25% in that short duration. But if I looked at, for instance, you know, Amazon here, where my net credit is $49, but yet my percentage of stock is only one and a half percent. I mean, anybody who trades Amazon knows that Amazon moves one and a half percent, moves two or three percent, moves five percent on a daily basis. So this dynamic of percentage of stock in terms of price movement and how much credit will be a, one of our first comparatives, all right? Next one, average implied volatility. Again, this is a comparative. How much Implied volatility relates to, again, the credit I'm going to receive and that percentage of stock. Uh, the BE negative and BE positive is our break-even spread in actual stock price. So it will actually give you the value. So if you went to your chart, um, you could easily uh, – put those values on your chart to give you those uh, spread uh, relationships and tell you so you can start looking at um, where those values are. So um, Peloton, I was looking at Peloton early today. I don't know if this was the actual uh, uh, expiration date that I was looking for, but let me go up here. And well, this was uh, one that was this morning that had popped up. And this is N phase energy. And again, here's our spread differential, right? I got that off of my uh, screener and I put these lines in for you guys. And again, what we're trying to strive for here is we want to get that break even near our swing highs and swing lows. And you can see here that over the last week or so that uh, N phase has been kind of just hovering around that $150 mark. All right. Okay. Uh, and then our probability, and again, we'll use this as a comparative to our net credit and our percentage of stock and our implied volatility. All right, so that's just the basic components of our screener. Now, you notice that, uh, let me, let's refresh this. 
and we got 183 candidates. So that's a lot of candidates to look through. So what we're going to do is we're going to do some minor adjustments in 192 now. Uh, we're going to do some minor adjustments in our base screener to help us narrow down our candidates. But then we'll also talk about some things that we can do to improve our odds. All right. So I'm going to go into set filters. And so the first input here is days to expiration. So one of the things we talked about was that theta is our friend and we see greater thetas inside of 20 days. So um, I'm going to look for days to expirations inside of that 20 days. Now, what I might do here is we'll, we've had this discussion before in um, all of our option strategy, and we talked about the difference between monthly expirations and weekly expirations, this, this, this risk that is involved because institutions tend to trade more monthly expirations and weeklies um, might not see as much volume or open your interest. And so this is an important risk that we need to be aware of in terms of if I'm going to use exit strategy or if I'm getting out, a weekly expiration might not have a lot of volume or open interest to support, you know, I will get out, but I might have to pay more to get out where the bid ask will be a little bit tighter on the monthlies. So one of the things I would suggest here is I would probably only look to set up this strategy in a monthly uh, expirations and look for those monthly expirations as they get inside that 20 days, but I might take time to set this trade up. So what I'll do is I'll look to how many days to our first monthly expiration and our first monthly expiration is in May. All monthly expirations are on the third week of third Friday. So for right now that would be 30 days out. All right. So I'll leave in weeklies just for to see look at candidates. All right. And the other minor adjustment we're going to make is that net delta. Right. So come down here. Here's our net delta. Notice that our filter here is 10 percent. And we said that, you know, you know, maybe inside of 5% would be something we want to start looking for. But I did say, right, 3%, right? Okay. And let's look at our results. So we're going from 192 down to 58, a little bit more manageable, okay? All right. So, again, at this point, I could do some comparative analysis, I could look at how much credit, right? Or I could start by saying, I wanna only look for stocks that have a larger stock percentage, how much credit I'm gonna take in, how much implied volatility that credit is worth, right? In terms of comparisons, right? For instance, uh, this, is, I think this is Marathon, Mar Mar oh, excuse me, Z, um, right? $20 worth of credit, 15% of the price, my implied volatility is a little bit lower. So you get a lot of credit and, and not a lot of implied volatility risk, right? But that that credit could be because in the short term, you might have, might have seen a, a spike in our implied volatility. All right, so that's where we're going to take us to our first filter. We're going to look inside of our filters, and we can – come in here and there's a lot of ways we can look for filters. We could just type in a symbol or a, 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 a phrase or something. But let's start with options overview. And the first one that I want to look at is my implied volatility rank. And we have a webinar about the difference between implied volatility rank and uh, percentage. So if you're interested in understanding what that represents. Um, and so Here's where I'm going to decide how hot I want my volatility, right? If I'm trading short-term durations, right, I'm looking, let's say, at trading opportunities, let's say, three days prior to expiration, then my candidates are probably going to have a super high rank, like 100%. That's fine. I just know that going in. But um, if my plan is to look at falling volatilities, right, maybe in my monthlies as I'm coming inside that 20-day period, then I certainly want to have a higher volatility, but maybe not a, a super high volatility, but probably in the top third, right, in like say 60% or higher, right? 
So I could look at a monthly implied volatility ranking as well. Now for our comparatives for this session, we'll talk about, we'll just make it easy. We'll just make it 50, right? We just want to make it in the upper half, right? Now again, right, let's just check our filter here. And boom, we've really knocked this down, all right? Um, go back to my screener. One of the other things I said to you is, you know, you could type in any phrase or uh, something you might be looking at. And for instance, here, one of the things we talked about was earnings, how that can affect us. So I could filter by uh, expires before earnings. And then I could add that if I wanted. And yeah, I want to make sure that it shows options that expire before earnings, yes or no. But sometimes um, some of these companies do not release their earnings date until about six weeks or eight weeks prior to the earnings date. But again, if we're inside 30 days and I see on my filter, oh, hang on, let me go back. Made a mistake here. So I'm going to include options that don't have earnings dates, and you're going to get the NA. Let's see. Right, you're going to get an NA. That doesn't mean that they're not going to do earnings. It just means they haven't announced the date yet, right? And if you're inside of 30 days, right, they're not going to announce an earnings date inside of 30 days. So you'll be all right with that. Now, don't hold me to that, but um, that's kind of just a general rule for you, all right? Okay. Um, so the next thing I'm going to look for is under my options overview is I'm going to look at my implied volatility change, right? And we're going to use this both for as a comparative, but also as a pulse, right? I'm going to look to see if my volatility is rising or falling. And again, I'm just going to look at from session to session, yesterday's versus today's. Um, stock percentage, all right? Now, we already have this as a filter, right? But what we're going to do here is we're going to um, qualify it, right? I'm going to start looking for candidates where I have a greater stock percentage as, as it relates to my price, right? Maybe I'm not going to look at five percenters, right? I'm going to look at, let's say, 10% um, or greater, right? Um, and, you know, on the upside, you know, I think when you start talking about a stock percentage of over 50%, that's a lot of volatility. I'm sure that market's volatility is rising and not falling. So, you know, maybe I'll cap it at 30 or 50% or something to that effect, right? So really, I'm really, I wanted the low one end on this one. I mean, you want it greater than uh, 10%, all right? Okay. Um, and then finally, one of the things that we can start doing is we can use other technical indicators to help us find these uh, candidates of falling volatility. So I'm going to go in here again, and I'm going to go to underlying asset. And some of you might be aware of this, and some of you might not. But there's something called the ATR, and ATR stands for average true range. Now, average true range is a measurement of volatility. I know it's so you might not realize that, but it basically says how much price movement you can anticipate on a day-to-day -day basis, right? And what we're going to do here is we're going to use our ATR to help us identify candidates by falling ATRs. In other words, we want to see our ATR volatility start to shrink. Now, we're going to do a comparative here. We're going to do the 20-day comparative, not greater value or lesser value or a between value, but we're going to do it against a field. Now, we do have some options here, and we have 9, 14, 50, and 100 day. We want to look at lower time frames versus our 20-day. So we'll do 10, excuse me, 9-day ATR. So what I'm saying is I want my nine day lower than my 20 day. And this will guarantee that whatever candidates pop up in my screener is that the price action is getting smaller. And that would relate to smaller uh, or falling uh, implied volatilities. And now, boy, we really narrowed down that list of almost 200 down 
to four, okay? So at this point here, we could just do our analysis. We can go into our main view, look at some different, uh, you know, the, the percentage of the stock, uh, the applied volatility, um, where my break-even prices are. Here's my future, future, future excuse, filter views. Say that three times fast. And there's our 20-day versus our nine-day. There's our percentage stock. And again, here's, you know, these two stocks I probably wouldn't trade because they're, um, let's see, let me check the price here. Well, maybe, yeah, this one, yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, here's our 20-day ATR. It was $2.18, where our nine day is $1.87. It's telling you that the range of this stock price is starting to shrink. And one of the ways we can kind of visualize that is through our flip charts. Okay. Notice SNAP came up, right? And, you know, maybe this not, might not be a great candidate in terms of a short strato, but you do see that we are seeing smaller ranges and, you know, but we are also seeing falling prices. And this is a $1 stock. I probably wouldn't be looking to do a short straddle on a $1 stock, right? Right? There's M, right? Macy's, right? Again, look what we're seeing here. We're seeing that our price is kind of stuck in range, right? So this would probably be a better candidate for our short straddle. Now, again, let's go to Snap, right? And again, we're kind of just floating right around that $60. So if I don't like this 20-day versus 9-day uh, filter, um, what uh, the other thing I can do is I can come into my flip charts, right? And I could create a template using ATR and what I did was I did create one for you guys and this one is based on a three-day moving average versus the 20 and I used a smooth moving average and you can you know I'll go into um, right click add study right and you can scroll down there there's average true range and you can change the period from the short period to the long period you can make it smooth you can make it exponential you can just make it a, a weighted or just a regular moving average so there's a lot of ways you can uh, change that but here's what we're trying to do right we want to see falling falling atr and falling short-term ATRs, right? Now, what I might do is wait for that little bump in the short-term ATR. That's where we're getting a little juice, a little volatility, but then I wanna see both of them falling, right? And so that's what we're seeing here in the SNAP example, okay? All right, so let's go back to our screener now. And if we like the parameters that have been designed in our screener, we thought about all of the different things that we wanted to add or things that we want to uh, keep in our screener. One of the things you can do now is you can go in here where it says save screener. And I can give it a name and I'll just call this webinar. Right. And I can write a little description of what it is, short straddles. And um, then, you know, do I use this screener as my main view, right? Or do I want to use the main view? Or do I want to use the filter view? Do I want earnings? How do I want this screener to be presented to me? Um, and then I can have it emailed to me, which is really important for us, right? Especially if I'm going to do this strategy, it's not going to happen every day. I'm going to be waiting for certain opportunities. So what I might do is have this emailed to me at midday, right? Usually what happens in with the screener is, you know, the market opens up in the morning and then by about 10, 1030, we start seeing some options activity. So by about noon central time, you know, you really start seeing these options start to trade and you'll get a better idea of which ones are starting to uh, present those opportunities. Um, you know, you can get it sent to you at the end of the day as well. Just realize that, you know, tomorrow's another day and if you're playing theta, you know, you're not going to get the same values uh, that you had uh, today. And again, I could look at the top 10 results or top 25 results or the top 50 results in terms of that and um, save that. And then that will be sent to me in my um, sent to me in, e in the email. And so that's what I did was I created a short straddle 
uh, filter and it's probably going to show a little bit more um, candidates because I made one just small adjustment on volume but um, again at this point here now I have you know about 30 candidates that I can start picking my way through to look for those greater trade opportunities and again I would probably start using my flip charts in terms of looking for those ranges of prices this is the one that I was kind of looking at at the beginning of the week you know again and this is a stock that has its earnings are either I think are today or tomorrow uh, so, you know, I don't know if I would be employing or deploying my strategy today, but I'd be setting it up saying, hey, if I could set this up after earnings and I can see this kind of consolidation of price, you know, that wedge or triangle or whatever you want to call it, this might be a good strategy where it looks like price is going to kind of, you know, after the fact, maybe stay right around $80, right? Um, let's see if Peloton is up. Oh, here's our snap right um let's see i know i know that i saw peloton earlier let's see i don't see it in in my list this morning now so um so that's kind of the scenario that we want to start working for right okay so let's go back to our slides right our keys to success right Shorter time, right? We want to be inside of that 20 days, right? That's where we're going to look for those greater thetas. We want to look for falling implied volatility environments, right? In other words, falling ATRs or um, when I start doing my comparisons between my short-term volatilities and my uh, longer-term volatilities. I want to see that crossover. I want to start seeing shrinking volatilities. Uh, I want to look for those markets where I'm very familiar with, right, that I know that are coming into a cycle of consolidation or, or we're going to be range-bound for the duration of the life of this straddle or the duration of what I'm going to try to hold this trade for. Setting those smaller realistic targets, right? We want to be only trying to capture maybe 25% of the total cap credit that we initially set this trade up because we're not going to take this all the way through expiration. And again, holding our positions for shorter period of times, that Steve Miller concept, right? Take the money and run, right? Not going to hold this for 20 days, right? You could, right? But, you know, you start taking on some more price risk. And then, again, for our uh, retail traders or our novices or those who are trying to learn this strategy, right, we want to avoid holding our short straddle through an earnings report. We can use earnings to find plump or inflated implied volatilities because of the coming earnings report, but we're going to not buy the rumor, we're going to sell the news. We're going to wait until afterwards. Okay. All right. Where are we in time, Gene? Let me check my clock here. Oh, we're doing well. Good. Okay. So let me take a break here, and I see a couple of my regulars. There's um, Richard asks, is, is X dividend a reason not to go forward with an options trade? Yeah, again, this is a risk that we need to be aware of, right? You have to assess that in terms of um, do you want to take that risk on? And so, yeah, I would say, you know, that's why this is an occasional trade. If I have any one of these outliers like an X dividend, yeah, I'm probably going to pass on that trade until at least after X dividend. Um, David Buck asks, uh, could we do a webinar on using Gamma? So, David, I will tell you that on our schedule that in sometime in the end of May or maybe in the beginning of June, we are going to talk about Greeks in specific, and we'll talk about, you know, how Greeks do impact um, our options and our options strategy. So we'll get into a little bit of that. So, David, good question, great suggestion. Um, just have some patience. We'll get to that. Um, and so Stephen asks, if you take this trade and buy the wings on either side for hedging protection, then it's an iron condor. All right, we'll go into um, 
butterflies and condors you can see on our website that you know we're just starting sh straddles short straddles we're going to do long straddles and then, then we'll do um uh, we're just going to follow this so uh again so to steven we will get an opportunity to talk about iron condors and and butterflies later okay um so Michael just dropped in a question. He says, can support and resistance play a part in assessing the range of the premium collected? Yes, Michael, that's exactly what we want to do. And let me go back, since I do have time here, is let me go back and, for instance, let's look at, which is the one we were looking at? Snap, right? Okay. that snap trade. And Michael, this is really where um, that difference between open interest and volume in our strikes could have an impact. So here's snap here. And again, there's that support in that resistance, right? That near-term support, near-term resistance, or these swing highs and swing lows. And there was on Monday, this is on the monthly, this is how much credit you would have been able to take in. So yeah, that would be definitely part of that process. But one of the other things you can do, which can help a little bit here, is I can go into my volatility in Greeks under my options. And again, I'm gonna do snap here. I'm not looking at the ones that are expiring these weeklies. Well, let's go to that first monthly, right? That May one. And this is why I really want you guys to kind of embrace this concept of just doing these on monthlies. I'm not that I'm not saying you can't do it on weeklies, but um, notice here that our $60 straddle, right, our $60 put in our call has a lot of open interest, right? And that is also kind of a telling sign, right? That could be uh, something to be uh, interested. But notice that every $5, right, in SNAP, you start seeing some greater open interest, right? $5 up and $5 up. Let me show you all of them. And you're not going to see this kind of increase in volume at very certain increments uh, in your weeklies, right? Your, most of your volume and open interest will be right around, you know, at the money on weeklies. But on monthlies, you can see, it looks like we're seeing a differential of about every $2.50, okay? Right? Six, six, uh, $65, uh, $70, right? So, what happens is when price gets to those strike prices, then you see a lot more activity in these options, and that can actually act as support and resistance based on the options. So great question there, Michael, um, uh, in terms of looking at not only your chart, but also looking at the depth of our market in terms of our open interest and volume on our different strike prices, okay? Uh, one of the uh, tricks you can do, Michael, is you take 85% or 0.85, the at the money uh, straddle right now, and that will kind of implies to you where the market thinks the price is going to go over that time period. So that's another little trick. And if you can find some good open interest and volume around that 85% of your at the money straddle, then that also kind of acts like a little bit of a buffer or as you would call it, support or resistance. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Al asks, if you recommend not doing short straddles through earnings, does it imply it's a good time to go long straddles? Well, yeah, I mean, if that's what you want to embrace, right? I mean, that would be if, let's say, your stock has come into a cycle of consolidation and you're using earnings as a catalyst for price impulse, then yes, that would be a great way to imply a long straddle, right? And that's would be the next strategy we'll we'll encounter. Probably not until we won't probably get into that until June or July, but that's ones we could do, all right? So Alan asks uh, in the description says risk is unlimited on these straddle. Can you talk about that? So Alan, yeah, um, 
in theory, it's unlimited, right? If the stock goes to infinity price, then they would be. In. But again, like I said, the risk is really based on your own stupidity. If your price goes above your break even and you still have that position on, yeah, and the stock continues to rise, think about Game Stock. Just just a few uh, months ago, Game Stock was trading around thirty two dollars, and it rose like thirty dollars on expiration day. And the next day, it gapped up a hundred dollars. If you took this through expiration, you would be in and out, you know, a hundred dollars for every share. And remember, one option is worth a hundred shares. So that you would put at, at his, you know, a huge, uh, substantial loss. Is it unlimited? Yeah, I mean, no. I mean, it is limited to about how much money that you have in your account, and your broker is going to stop you out once you reach a certain limit. So it is limited, but in terms of theory, it is unlimited, okay? All right, Gene, is there any other questions that I've missed? I see a couple that you popped up here. No, I think you're uh, covering everything. Uh, all the questions are taken care of here. Okay, cool. Um, I wanna remind everybody that, um, and Gene can help me out here, that um, we do have a free trial for some of the premium service uh, services that are revolved. Gene, what are some of the aspects in terms of options that a premium member can anticipate with their subscription? Well, the uh, option strategy that you covered today, John, is part of a bar chart premier membership. Uh, so in order to go in and run these screeners, view these strategies, change the filters, save the screeners based on how you'd like them set up, uh, you do require a premier membership. There are uh, really there's there's a ton of different things that you get with Bar Chart Premier. Uh, if you are interested and if you go to that Bar Chart Premier tab on our website, there's a big, long, lengthy description of what you get with uh, with Bar Chart Premier over a basic free membership. So I encourage you to do that. And if you have any further questions, our support group is there to help you out. Um, one thing I also do want to say, because a couple people have been asking, is there a recording available? Yes, you're going to get an email a little bit later on this afternoon with a link to the recording. And you can always find all of our archived webinars, on, John's shown you now, on our free webinars page. It's in the tools menu on the Bar Chart website. Excellent. Excellent. And since we're here. <laughs> right. <laughs> Let's talk about next week. And so next week, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into trading plan. And this is a follow up uh, to our. Um, where is it? I think it's down here. Trading ideas or word trading plan. I'm just trying to remember where I saw it. Help me At out the very here, bottom, Jesus. bottom left, more trading ideas, how to play on. Uh, um, I'm sorry, that's. No, where was the no, one that was on trading? The, in the right column, right above, right above Dogs of the Dow. Oh, there like, it is. Yeah, how to build a successful plan. trading plan from December. So, you know, I would encourage you as a prerequisite, watch that. And we're going to build upon that. But we're going to talk about uh, setting up exit strategies. I, one of them. A common uh, mistakes traders make or investors make is they do a really good job on finding, you know, the perfect entry, but they have no exit strategy or they have no plan to get out, right? And we're going to look at not only pre-entry exits, right, or exit, but also looking how to enhance our profitability um, and setting. Um, post entry exits as well uh, especially as the market starts to reward us so we'll take a little bit a deeper dive into how to build a better trade plan and we're really going to be concentrating more on these these exit strategies okay all right so um that is it for today i hope you enjoyed today's session i know i want to thank you and gene will probably say the same thank you guys for being here i want to say to you guys you know the best of all health uh stay safe out there and um the best of all trading okay and once again thank you for visiting barchart.com and for being with us today we appreciate it bye-bye now <laughs>